Wonderful. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Constance. I work in alumni career development with the University of Chicago. Our goal is to create a network, a community of University of Chicago professionals so that we can help you wherever you are in, in your professional development journey with events, resources, and connections. Um, and speaking of connections, that is what this event is all about. Um, we are convening three pretty great expert networkers from the U Chicago uh, community of alumni and friends um, to come together and share a little bit about the art of networking, small talk, and big ideas. So um, before I jump in, I just want to give a, a few quick housekeeping notes. This session will be recorded, um, and we'll send the recording to all registrants afterwards. Um, if you don't mind keeping yourself on mute um, throughout the first part of this conversation, it's going to be a, a moderated panel. Um, and then in the last 15 or 20 minutes, we'll jump into some breakout rooms. You can put your networking into practice. At that point, I encourage you to come off mute, come on to camera, um, and really make some meaningful connections with this community. Um, and with that, it's time to, to jump right in. I'm going to introduce our three panelists today. I'll start with Dory Bowling, a licensed clinical social worker who graduated from Loyola University in Chicago with a master's degree in social work and a specialization in clinical counseling of individuals and families. She received her bachelor's degree in applied psychology from UIC. Um, and Dory has more than 10 years of management and leadership experience. She enjoys helping others learn ways to manage and develop healthy and functional teams. Um, I love this motto, Dory, that you shared with us. I am in the business of changing lives. She works hard at listening, developing relationships, and making sure clients feel understood so that she can better assist them on their journey of change and growth. We also have Danielle Hawa-Tariga joining us today, a recent econ grad from University of Chicago. She currently works as a Kimpton Fellow at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Outside of her academic and professional experiences, she published her first book in August 2020, titled Uplift and Empower, A Guide to Understanding Extreme Poverty and Poverty Alleviation. And in her free time, which I don't know how you have any, um, she enjoys knitting and improving her photography skills. And then finally, we've got Alicia Basic, a leadership and performance advisor to individuals and teams internationally. She provides clients with guidance in maximizing individual effectiveness, op optimizing strategic cohesion, and shifting cultures. I love this. Her clients have nicknamed her a CEO whisperer, a work shrink, Olivia Pope, Yoda, and a drill sergeant. You have all the titles. Um, she's an online contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Oprah Magazine, HuffPost, and CNN, and is the author of and the cloud yelled back. She was named one of the top 100 leadership speakers in 2017 by Inc. Magazine's Lead X. And she has an MBA in finance and marketing from the University of Chicago Booth and a bachelor's in political science from Wesleyan University, and then certified in mediation through Northwestern University School of Law. So um, I think it's pretty clear. We've got a pretty phenomenal panel here today. And we're in a really unique space where these three people are kind of having their first networking conversation together as a group. We purposely didn't bring the panelists together beforehand to connect because we wanted some impressive networkers to do their thing live in front of this audience. Um, so to that point, Alicia and Dory know each other, they're connected. In fact, Alicia, the expert networker she is, connected us with Dory for this panel. Um, and then Danielle, you haven't met these two. So let's just kick off this event about networking with some showing rather than telling with a little bit of networking. Um, so how does a, a fruitful conversation begin with you three? Well, I think, you know, looking at it from the perspective of going where you're comfortable, right? So you ask about the things that you were interested in. You just gave me all of this information about Danielle, right? I don't know her. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she wrote a book. You know, so I'm like, oh, wait, tell me about your book. You know, like that's, that's how you kind of start that conversation and begin to get dialogue where it doesn't feel like that there's as much pressure because I actually care about what I'm talking about versus just, you know, the weather or, or things like that. So Danielle, tell me about your book. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for asking. And again, thank you so much, Sam, for coordinating this event. Really happy to be here um, and chatting with everyone. Yeah, so um, right in my fourth year, I guess I'll start from the beginning of the story. Um, at U Chicago, it's not uncommon for undergraduates to pursue either investment banking or consulting um, out of undergrad. And I was on the investment banking track working um, over the summer, just passionate about finance and wanting, wanting to find a way to channel that passion. But I couldn't help but notice that I was working on these million dollar, sometimes even billion dollar deals while passing by homeless people on my way to work every day. And this, that 
that contrast just stuck with me throughout the entire summer. Um, got to the end of the summer, realized that banking wouldn't be the best fit for me career-wise. And I still had this question in my mind of how are these two worlds coexisting? And I happened to get a phone call from a professor from Georgetown University. He reached out to me with the opportunity to write a book. And I said, sure, why not? I'm really curious about this topic. And I'm, I, I don't have to write a thesis for my degree. So I have the time um, to, to write a book. Um, and I did just that. So I started off just really asking questions. Of course, didn't really know anything about international development, about extreme poverty, but I wanted to learn more. And I figured I couldn't possibly be the only college age student who was curious about this topic. Um, so I wrote what I hoped would be an opportunity for people who maybe didn't have time to do research, just learn as much as they could in one book and then go on from there and help to alleviate poverty in their community. So I don't proclaim to be an expert. I don't proclaim to have some sort of catch all perfect solution to poverty alleviation. I really encourage people to embrace the nuances of addressing poverty where they are first before flying out to some low income country and trying to save the world there. Start from home, start from where you are and also just center the voices of people who are living in extreme poverty as well. I think it's really important to get the perspectives and opinions and solutions that come from people who are facing the problem themselves. And that's kind of, I guess the, the background story of the writing itself and a little bit about its contents, just wanting to learn more about this topic and also knowing that there are tons of young people who are curious about this and wanting to help, but not really sure where to start. And I encourage people to start with start with my book, start from there and then move forward and make it far. Interesting. So, Dory, I think I lost sound on Danielle. Dory, are yeah. you hearing me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay. You. Okay, great. Now I hear everyone again. Dory, have you ever thought about writing a book? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I have, you know, and I'm one of those people that um, have a lot of weird thoughts in my head and then I just get them out loud. And so I've I know had this about you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have told me that I should even just do like a coffee table book of my one-liners or like write my story. But then I also have a, um, a six and a half year old son who has autism. So I've thought a lot about writing a book that kind of speaks to him and, and you know, his peers and kind of some of the struggles and things that they may face throughout life and how to, to work through it and still feel confident and love themselves. So I have so many thoughts in my head. It's just, you know, like Danielle said, it's, it's about having the time. And one of these days I'll have or I'll just make myself have it. That's that's the thing that I have to do. Is make myself. Can you give us one or one of your favorite one-liners? Oh my God! See, that's the thing. I don't even know because I just say whatever. <laughs> but you know what? I'll I'll relate it back to what Danielle was talking about because I think back to when I used to ride the the train. You know, I used to be on the red line going back and forth from UIC and the blue line, and um, being just a natural empath on the train. In my mind, I would always think about, you know, you see different people and you can see that maybe they're struggling or, and I would get teary eyed thinking about, I bet when their mother had them, they didn't envision that this is where they would end up in life, mm -hmm. you know, or that they would be sort of um, in poverty or unable to care for themselves or sleeping on this train. Um, and so those are the types of things that float around in my head. Sometimes they're a lot more comical and less, you know, cry worthy, but um, that's, so that's why I wanted to ask about your yeah. book, because I know for me, I'm one of those people that I have those thoughts and, and it's like, what do you, what do you do with it? Yeah. So I think this is an interesting time for us to break and, and kind of dissect what we just did mm -hmm. for all the participants to learn um, what, what happened there and what worked and maybe what didn't work. Mm -hmm. I dare say. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, does, does anyone want to want to start with their observations about what worked and didn't work about that? Well, I, as in us, or are we asking for the community? No, no, I'm asking us. I just, um, I, yeah. I'm happy to, but I, but I also um, wanted to, to give space for anyone else to step in and make observations. Yeah, well, I think you can go because I think, you know, Dalia and I may have talked more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I observed more. And actually, it's a great point you just made, Dory, of course, because I do observe more than average person does. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a Latinx family. There were always at least the, the six of us, and then usually many more people at the dinner table. And I almost never talked. I mm. was the one observing everyone. I was the quiet one. And, um, and I'm still this way. 
and and Dory's going to talk more about this later. So I have to sort of force myself to talk. So when I just did that, when I when I did the small talk, it was like a lot of self talk had to happen for me to say, okay, now talk, now do it. Here's what you're going to say, now do it. And no yeah. one would notice that on the outside. I'm I'm the expert here because I've done it 10 million times. But I do have a process that I know I have to go to, and I'm sharing it with all of you. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a few, there's a few key things that that happened that that made this thing work. So one thing that happened is that um, we all uh, had the goal of the interaction being what I call mutually enriching. So mm -hmm. everybody was thinking that they wanted it to be interesting for everyone else. They weren't just thinking about themselves or the other person. It was like a two-way thing we were all going for. So you're always going for a mutually enriching moment, even in that small talk. And the a really easy way to do it, which is a technique that was that was used here successfully, is you want to share information that the other person is not otherwise privy to. Okay, so they otherwise don't know it. So that means that we're, we're hearing about uh, the impetus of a book being written that we definitely would not have known if Danielle had not told us. We would never know about what happens when Dory's sitting on a train if she had not told us. So like that. Um, and uh, the only, and part of what you need to do to develop that is you need to walk around the world cataloging moments that happen to you as stories, as little tiny stories that you might one day tell. And if you actually go with the intention of categorizing them that way as little mini stories, your brain actually somehow puts it in a different place where you can access it in the future versus not having that intention and then you just can't access it, it's gone. Um, and um, the, the last one um, that I saw happen is you have to actually really like in your heart, be so curious to learn yeah. about the other person. You have to like really want to know, not pretend want to know, but really want to know almost like an anthropologist. Uh, and uh, because that actually comes across. So I'll pause there. I think even with that, um, you know, when you're thinking about it, there are dynamics to any conversation, any relationship. And I think one of the reasons, Alicia, that you and I are, are good friends is because I am that oversharer while you are the, <laughs> the sort of like observer. And so it works because I'll overshare, then you chime in and then you give me this and then I'll keep going. And so like, it, it makes it very easy. It's an easy flow. Um, and so that's when it's like, oh, do you want to talk about small talk? I'm like, sure, I'll talk about anything, you know? <laughs> So I think that you have to kind of walk into the conversation knowing who you are and how it works for you and being okay with it. You know, um, that's why I said, start with where you're interested. So if you just walk into the group, right, and it's already a conversation going, listen for those things that you know you might have some more questions about or something that you can really be present with. Like Alicia said, that sort of passion to learn and pay attention, because if not, then it will seem really forced and it'll die, it'll land flat, so. Yeah, actually, I love that. Uh, I think. Oh, go ahead, Danielle. I'm sorry. Yeah, just um, one thing that came up a lot. Um, I know when I was just chatting with like fellow undergrads um, at U Chicago was the the uncertainty surrounding having networking conversations and kind of feeling like they were forced, or feeling like they were awkward. And I always yeah. encourage people to do what's been shared, which is one, try to have interesting stories and just kind of as you practice, get used to like kind of showing that telling. Um, that you are interesting, that you are intelligent, like trying to show not to all of these different qualities of yourself in the conversations versus like trying to kind of prove things about yourself mid combo through things. Um, and then in addition to that as well, just seeking out interesting people because if you're constantly network networking with people who you may not find interesting, it's harder to ask those good questions. It's harder to have that natural curiosity. And of course the conversations will feel forced and awkward. So seeking out interesting people, um, asking interesting questions that get the conversation going helps a lot. And it just helps to overcome the awkwardness as well. So seek out people that you have almost like a natural affinity for through either their career or their personal interests or, or just hobbies as well too, just connecting in that sense. That's a great segue, Danielle, that word awkward that you just used. I want to just um, ask Dory as a, a therapist by training, uh, you know, you gave the example that one thing that works really well in the flow of our conversations is that we know I'm a, a, more of an observer, mm -hmm. you are more of a talker. What, what we should talk about what happens when there are two people who are both less likely to talk, uh, you know, yeah. more observer types. 
or two who are talker types and maybe yeah. talking over each other. So maybe I'll speak to the former, you speak to the latter from yeah. experience. <laughs> so um, it's awkward when it's two people who are, are not likely to want to talk too much. And um, it's more effort for sure. And so uh, what I do is I have to sort of force myself into a different type of persona and tell myself to be more like a Dory or a Danielle and just crank it up. And that the, the moment will pass and nothing bad <laughs> nothing bad's gonna happen. It's just a little more effort for me. And yeah. then I can do that successfully. And again, I'm sharing that with all of you, but no one would ever know this about me because I've and because these things do take practice. And when you practice a lot, no one will notice this, uh, the difference um, in, in those two modes that you're in. So um, Dory, what about you when you're with another person who's just wanting to talk a lot? Oh my gosh. So I think it's a really good idea to think of like a 20 second rule, you know, and I feel like there's a, um, a book that speaks to this, but I can't remember the name of the book right now. Um, when you're talking, it's, it, there have been studies that shown that people are really interested and engaged if it's a conversation for about 20 seconds. And then after that, it can be like Danielle said, it sounds like you're maybe bragging on yourself or you're not actually interested in them. And so then people will start to pull back like, okay, so she just wants to talk about her. So for me, I try to, and, and it didn't serve me well, like in, in college and grad school, right? So you got to do speeches. So I, I'm, I'm about being concise in my stories and everything, because I never want to seem like I'm dragging on. And um, when you have to do a 15 minute speech, I'm like, oh, I think I said everything in the first five minutes. Yeah. So now I have to fill it up with something else. So you have to kind of find that balance. But just in general conversation, you want to make sure that you don't over talk the other person or keep going on and on and on think about when you're starting it what is the point like you know we already said have those stories what is the gist of this and and find the most interesting way to get to it <laughs> yeah and there's absolutely no shame in sharing with like, practicing with friends either I think that helped me a lot too I had a lot of like just uncomfortable networking conversations when I first started my, my journey of learning how to network and what helps me a lot too is just reaching out to close friends of mine and asking them could we just have a practice conversation where I share a couple of stories with you they share a couple of stories with me um, and that just it just helps you to ease your nerves a bit as well just doing that so don't be afraid to reach out to close friends or family members even and just practice telling those stories yeah that's a great idea and also another uh, great audience for practicing is your neighbors, people in your building or in your neighborhood, they, uh, you usually might just walk by and say hi and that's it, if you're mm -hmm. like me. <laughs> you actually push yourself a little more and ask how are you doing and ask questions about the dog or whatever it is and that's great practice in the elevator, great practice, mm -hmm. all that in uh, t talking to the server briefly because they're working, they don't have too much time to, so all, all those, look for those opportunities to practice. Yeah. And Alicia, you touched a little bit on preparing yourself mentally ahead of time. Um, are there any other like concrete steps that you take to, to prepare, or maybe this falls into the category of practice, mm -hmm. whether it's research or having question, a question bank, a story bank, and anything mm -hmm. that you do? And I'll start with Alicia, and then and we can move to the group. Yeah, exactly what you said. So you, you develop a bunch of stories. Um, I'm not one to recommend uh, telling the same stories over and over again. That's, that's a, a, a bit, uh, comes off as, as um, with a, a, some kind of an affect or something like that. Um, but just practice telling stories, period. To, to capture things as stories, tell them sometime when you think of them. And um, the, so the, another technique is to s scan your environment for details. And what that means is it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter what you're doing, turn that, that you crank that up, that attention to details, and you'll start noticing things, even in the environment in which you are having the small talk, which become very interesting topics of conversation, whether it's a painting you would not have otherwise noticed, um, something, uh, something that's broken sitting on a table nearby, all these little things that that when you, when you crank up that focus on the details, um, they, they can become centerpieces for that discussion. I think looking at it from sort of the therapist side and recognizing that people have social anxiety. This is a real disorder. This is something that people can really struggle with. Um, and you know, whether or not, I don't know if our audience 
has done any therapy or looked into ways to work with that, but it's really about grounding yourself prior to. And what happens a lot with social anxiety is the person is anxious or nervous about saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. And so tell yourself kind of, you have to kind of talk to yourself a little bit, like what would be the wrong thing that I could say? You know, like, so if you are prepping your story, start thinking about that. Like, okay, I know I wanna go in here and I wanna try to talk about the field that I'm in or possibly, you know, um, a career path. So if you stay on that, then how would you say the wrong thing outside of that? Think, stay away from faux pas and things like that. So talk yourself through the things that you might be anxious about. And then also the big question is asking yourself, what's the worst that could happen? So I go here, I say something that either isn't funny or it's not interesting. And then, you know, people walk away and then I go on to the next group, you know? So it really, you really, right. It's like, it won't be the end of the world actually. And so you have to really allow yourself to be realistic about it and grounded in what's really gonna happen. Maybe before you even walk in the room, stand there, feet firmly planted, take five deep breaths and through the nose, out through the mouth and remind yourself, no matter what happens, I'm gonna walk out of here and I'll be fine. And just, and just take that when you're walking into the space. And can I ask, um, Danielle, do you mind if I ask Dory another question about that before we go on? Um, so Dory, you know, you just described social anxiety, which I mm -hmm. think is really interesting. And I, I hope you'll talk about more. I described some thing, not without naming it, just someone who's just not, not likely to want to talk a lot. Yeah. Right. And Earth. yeah, mm -hmm. so, right. And so is introversion a different thing than those, or is it part it of is. those or like, because introvert, it's, they're not necessarily nervous to be in the space. They just don't, you know, have that much to say, or they would prefer to observe rather than speak. Someone who's socially anxious can be dealing with actual physical and um, physiological symptoms. So, you know, um, they get sweaty, they get shaky, their voice there, you know, may crack, their heart rate may go up. And so those are all the things that they're nervous will happen while trying to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're in that state, your mouth gets dry, you can barely speak. Those are things that th those people are dealing with um, versus like, oh, this is a cool space and I'm here and I'm listening and I'm learning, and I'm observing and I'm taking everything in. And I feel just fine with that. People who are okay. social, even if they're not speaking, they're still anxious. And an introvert is an anxious, but an introvert does, it takes a little more effort to actually yeah. go ahead and do the chit chat. And and small talk. Is, okay. yeah. yeah, great. Thank you for clarifying. That's, like, that's actually a really interesting distinction. Thank you for clarifying that. I'd say that I'm on the introvert side of things, but it was really interesting to hear like the, the core differences though, between when introversion kind of becomes anxiety in a way. That's really interesting. So yeah, that's, sorry. Yeah, that was cool. Um, I guess in terms of like advice um, for preparation, um, of course, like research, as you mentioned already, um, that always helps a lot. And I am a bit like formulaic in my approach to networking sometimes. Um, so I have like these core categories that I usually try to have questions for. Um, one of them is asking personal questions. So usually I'll just ask like, how did you end up in the industry that you're currently working in? Or how did you end up um, at the company you currently work at now? Just kind of questions to try to get to know the person and their journey. Um, and then beyond that, I'll usually ask questions about the company they work for. Um, typically cultural questions or just questions that I couldn't easily find the answer for from a website um, really quickly. Just trying to understand the company from their unique lens. Um, and then beyond that, usually I ask like career trajectory questions, like why did you move from X company to Y company? Um, how did you choose this company now? And like, what, how do you, where do you see yourself in the company a few years from now? And then usually because I'm, I'm young and I have the <laughs> advantage of asking these kinds of questions, I'll just ask, do you have any advice for someone at my stage in my career? Or mm -hmm. um, do you have anything, do, do, you, do you regret anything that you've done in your career so far? What kind of, like, what would you do now to address maybe mistakes you made earlier or are, are there any questions that you wish you'd asked earlier in your career? I usually get some really great responses from people as well. So just having those categories in mind helps me to avoid that initial frustration in the research phase of just what should I even ask when I get there? And then I just kind of work from there, um, trying to understand the best way to move forward. And I usually mix in just kind of more casual follow-up questions as the conversation progresses, but I have those categories in mind as I'm chatting with someone. Um, I have a question. Really interesting. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Elaine. Yeah, sure. My, yeah, my name is Elaine. Um, uh, based on the conversation, the practice conversation you guys had. Okay, what happens when the person says, you know, you, the person says, I wrote a book. And you say, oh, great. What's your book about or whatever? And, and luckily, in this case, it was something 
I actually knew something about. So I was really interested and I was ready and able to follow. What happens when you ask a question and the response comes back and you're like in over your head and you know it and you want to, you don't know what to do. Like if they had said, you know, uh, my book was about um, the inner workings of uh, Pope John, the, you know, the, the Pope's mind yeah, yeah. <laughs> during, during the, um, the invasion of Normandy or something like, or, or the Norman invasion, because it's like a historical thing. And you're sitting there going, wow. <laughs> and, then, and that's all you can say is just like, wow, because you're not a Catholic mm -hmm. and you don't know anything about the Norman invasion, but you know, it has something vaguely to do with history. Now, <laughs> now what? And you don't, you can't really back out of the question because you ask the guy or gal, mm -hmm. you know, what's the book about? So you got to at least sit through whatever <laughs> they say, you know, and you're trying to figure it out and you feel stupid. Oh, well, well, you know, I would say show up as your authentic self, you know, and, and, and just be honest and say, you know, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, but that sounds really interesting, you know, <laughs> Thank you. I just learned something from you. And you can always ask follow-up questions, you know, but I think it's okay to just be honest and say, I don't, I don't know what any of that is. When did that attack happen or Pope who, you know, and, and I think that that will let the person know um, how deep to go with the conversation, right? Because you don't want them to start going on and on and on. You're, you just like the little Tweety birds are going around your head. So <laughs> I, I, I love that. Another thing that you can do, and that's all very helpful, yeah. if you want to do something else, is to pick up on whatever little thread. So when someone's talking to you, even at that sort of a disconnect level, there's there's um, they're li they're leaving you little clues, little Easter eggs. And so of all the things you just named, the one thing that I was able to connect the dots on in my brain is that that has something to do with religion. I'm yeah. sure of it. And so to just pick up on, oh, was religion a big part of your upbringing? Okay, now we're okay. I can talk about that with anyone. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's right. Segue it to something that you you grab from that that you do know and understand. <laughs> yeah. And how does a conversation change? Uh, you know, you're picking up on breadcrumbs. You mentioned Alicia in the environment, for example, alongside the breadcrumbs in in the actual conversation. How does that change when we're sitting here on Zoom versus when we're in a room together and we can, you know, talk about the weather because we're all in the same place. We can talk about that thing over there because we're all at an event together. What what are the shifts, um, subtle or or not so subtle, that happen in a virtual networking environment? I think the biggest one that I found over this, you know, last, we can't even say a year anymore, almost 18 months, is you start to like comment on people's environment. You know, we, we logged in here and I was like, oh, Danielle, I'm still in that. I like the blur, you know, like, <laughs> and so that just starts a conversation. Then we had a whole conversation about Zoom and how we hope the world opens up just from that one little observation of what was in her room and her space. And, and it kind of branches off from that naturally. So you can also use that. Um, while we're in Zoom, because I think that gave everyone a window into everyone's world. You know, this this time that we've been in right now, you're getting to see people's homes. And I know for me, I'm amazed that she hasn't shown up, but typically my cat is just strolling back and forth in front of my camera. And so all of those things lead lend themselves to, you know, the kind of small talk and networking that can happen, you know. Yeah, I think like usually the Zoom backgrounds are one that has come up a lot for me just in meetings like day to day at work. There's there's one work stream that I'm on right now where a woman in the team constantly has a different Zoom background. And that's always how every meeting opens is just commenting on her most recent Zoom background. I think it's a really fun. Actually, I did have Harper Library as my background and I changed it because I thought that might be too distracting. <laughs> but I think that's that's one element of a way you can start a conversation that way. I do think weather is still a possible conversation topic, especially now because we're all over all over the world in different places. Mm -hmm. So I, I sometimes will just ask anyone like, oh, like, what's the weather been like where you are for the past week or so? Or how's the weather today? What are you thinking about doing this weekend? So you can still kind of like fit in the, those same like classic small talk questions. And there's, they're almost more interesting now because we're all like in our own different locales and, and just experiencing life in different ways now. So you can still incorporate them. There's just, it's just a kind of a different approach to it now. And 
what are your what are your thoughts on finding the right people to network with? I mean, you touched on this a little bit, Danielle, before about finding people who you have common interests with or you really want to make an authentic, meaningful connection with. Sometimes it's a little bit hard and sometimes it involves some cold outreach to people that you don't know. Um, any advice on on finding the right people that you can connect with, whether it's to make a meaningful community and, and have a meaningful conversation or whether it's for career growth? I love using LinkedIn um, and this will probably sound like an ad, but I, I've, I've, LinkedIn is my absolute favorite tool for networking because more often than not, you find people who've shared, like shared the majority of their career journey in one space. And if they're active on LinkedIn, then you're seeing posts from them all the time. You get a sense of the kind, the kind of posts they share, the kind of posts they write, what recent events they've been going to. Like there, there's just, it's just a treasure trove of information. Um, and I also recommend people as well, like kind of build up their own LinkedIn profiles too, just so that they can, that you're providing that information for other people as well. So you have more in-depth conversations and it kind of helps you to move forward beyond just surface level questions and get into the nitty gritty details that lead to really interesting conversations with people. If you're starting off of a baseline, um, I've heard mixed opinions about telling people that you've looked them up on LinkedIn. Some people are flattered by it and some people are not. Um, so I guess kind of gauge it as the conversation is going, but LinkedIn for me has been really helpful just to find people who have either done things that I think are interesting or are on like similar paths as me or are in the industry. And I think that's in a space that I haven't really explored with much depth, but yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn is my, my go-to space for, for research, for understanding background, and for just trying to get a sense of what a person likes um, to talk about, to do um, hobbies-wise, career-wise. So yeah, I absolutely love LinkedIn for that. And thanks for posting um, that link. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to look on that at that, Sam. Um, another thing, my favorite thing that I did uh, during the pandemic in terms of helping people to meet each other is I have about a dozen people that I mentor regularly, young adults. And so I started gathering them together monthly so that they actually started getting to know each other. And then after we did that several times, I asked them each to invite one person that they thought would fit well into this mentee group. And so then they started meeting each other's people. And, um, and there's a lot of variations you can do on that. So if you are mentoring people, even if it's a smaller group, that's something you can do to, to help your mentees to continue to meet people through this tough time. If you have a mentor, it's an idea you can bring to them to ask them if they might do that with their other, that let them know that you'd like to meet their other mentees. And you can even offer to organize and host that. It's a great idea and, and finding those people like you, Alicia, in your life who are those super connectors, the people who are, are willing and, and able to connect you with the folks in their network. It's it's always a really useful tool to have. I'd love to hear, oh, go ahead, Dory. A super connector. That was the perfect time for Alicia. She's a super connector. That's yes. your list of, of titles. <laughs> yes, yeah, add it to the list, right? <laughs> Um, and so, Danielle, you mentioned finding folks on LinkedIn. I, I agree. I think it's a great way to connect um, and, and find already, you know, learn a little bit about someone, find some commonalities, find some, some questions that you want to dig into a little further. So let's say you find someone really cool on LinkedIn. How, what kind of message would make one of the, the three of you actually want to talk to somebody? If you get a message from someone on LinkedIn, what's in that message that makes, you know, them stand out to you and, and makes you want to spend 20 or 30 minutes on a call having having a networking coffee with them. I don't know. I'm, I'm less of a, a LinkedIn user. <laughs> or email, either one. Active at this point. Um, but I don't really, really for me, it, it's more about being connected via someone I already know, because then I trust that they're sending me someone who's uh, uh, sane. <laughs> And, and ready to um, really do some quality work and not just, you know, be strange. I think I'm still a little, I'm, I don't know if I'm older. Well, I'm older than Danielle, certainly. Um, mm -hmm. But <laughs> I'm less engaged in the, the social media type aspects of meeting people. Yeah. <laughs> I'll actually add on to my, my, oh, I hope I didn't interrupt anyone, add on to my earlier point um, about LinkedIn too. And because we've been talking about the importance of like sharing interesting stories and things, LinkedIn is a really great way to kind of own your story too. And that's another reason why I think it's valuable is because it's kind of like the first touch point in terms of 
getting out like the the parts of yourself that you'd like to share. Um, so yeah, I just I think on that point, like owning your story, that LinkedIn is really helpful tool to do that. In terms of messages that usually get my attention, um, again, that's where the profile really comes in handy. Um, because you can just pick out one key element of a person's profile and make sure you mention that in your in your opening message. Obviously, I I, I usually dislike it when someone leads with an ask. If I if I've never spoken to you before and the first thing you're asking me for is a favor, I'm it usually kind of throws me off. Um, so typically, I like to open with a detail from their profile and then from there just asking for 15 minutes of time. And that use that usually helps. And that, those are the those are the messages that I typically respond to as well. Um, but for the most part, um, as long as you're not like, immediately opening up the conversation with a favor of some sort, um, if I've never spoken to you before, usually it's helpful to just have at least like one initial conversation and just build the relationship first before um, getting into getting into favors and things like that. Um, so yeah, like for the most part, using LinkedIn as a tool to, to own my story and tell interesting stories and then receiving messages and sending messages that are based on that person's profile to show that you've at least looked up who they are in their background first before reaching out. In my case, uh, and I think this is probably true for a lot of University of Chicago alum, but not all, but enough uh, that, that you, I would recommend you keep this in mind. I've never received an email from a University of Chicago student or alum and not responded. Hmm. There's, there's a sense of community that we have, many of us, um, and we want to uh, be part of building this community. And so, uh, I realize that I'm opening myself up to, uh, you know, all the people on this call and those who will listen to this video in the future, but that's okay. I'm not worried about that. I've, I'm a, I have a good sense of uh, a good ability to set boundaries with these things. So what I'm looking for, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll respond even if I don't find this, but what I'm really looking for, what's m making it more likely that I'm going to use that, uh, a super connector uh, uh, to talent uh, in, in the direction of, of the person who's emailed me is um, have they really taken the time to prepare that email? It, you know, mm -hmm. am, I, am I getting a, a two second email or is this something that really a lot of thought went into preparation? Um, you know, that book, I can't remember the title is something like um, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Uh, did this person think slowly as they were? preparing this email. And uh, if so, I will be much more likely to respond also in a thoughtful way. I think that's a great point. Um, and a call to action to everyone on this call to pay it forward as you continue receiving um, notes to connect from the Chicago community. I'm, I'm in total agreement with you, Alicia, that, that there's a lot of power in this network that we have. Um, so that's a, a great point. Um, so we've been talking a lot about, you know, cultivating meaningful connections. How do you find the, the folks to network with? Um, once you feel like you've been really working on developing relationships and honing your networking skills and, and building a community, how do you continue to stay in touch? Um, how do you strengthen the relationships over time? How do you follow up? Um, what, what are the steps that you all take? Yeah, I think um, with those situations, it's always good. And this is actually something that Alicia taught me is that when you're setting an expectation for the next follow-up to kind of give like a date, you know, so, so that you kind of hold yourself to it. And that person is also expecting it to come through. And it's not just a, Hey, I can't remember what we last talked about, but this is more like we, we are scheduling this follow-up. So um, rather than just, okay, I'll follow up with you soon. Say, how about we follow up on Wednesday at such and such time so that you kind of have this path moving forward and it continues to feel like there's something being worked on rather than it was just dropped and now I might pick it up when I think about it again or you know, and and with life who knows when you <laughs> pick it up again so I think really giving yourself a date and kind of like that moving forward task is a really good way to do that just to add the exact quote of of what Dory was referring to is I always tell all my clients this and all my friends without a deadline, it's nothing but a loose end. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 So I've been using a lot, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Of course. Go ahead, Danielle. I think 
Sorry, my connection was a bit unstable, so I wasn't sure if it was frozen or not. Um, yeah, usually I like to ask um, like a follow-up question. Um, I, of course, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier. I always send out a thank you note as well. That helps a lot um, just to maintain that relationship too. So typically thank the person for their time, um, no matter how short the conversation is. Everyone's always really busy. So I just make sure to just follow up, say thank you for their time. Um, I typically try to include reminders of what we spoke about in my follow-up emails as well, just because again, everyone's really busy. So I mentioned a couple of the key points from my conversation, maybe a couple of the key questions that I asked. This is where preparation helps because if you're just in a daze of networking and you forget some of the questions you've asked, if you've already had a couple of them pre-prepared, just mention those in your follow-up email as well. And just reminding that person for future reference, like what you spoke about, what you asked about, and then a couple of key points that they shared. And then beyond that as well, um, usually if I don't get through all my questions, I can use that as a springboard for a future conversation. So I can say, oh, had a really good conversation with you, but I'd love to learn about this topic. Um, would you be willing to meet up again later? Um, and then in terms of just maintaining relationships, I've, I've heard a lot of advice on this topic, ranging from sending articles that you find are interesting to your contacts to having a newsletter that you share with your network monthly or quarterly. Um, so I guess it depends on the person and what you're willing to maintain. Um, but what's helped for me is just, again, using LinkedIn as a tool, finding interesting articles that I like and sending them off to people in my network. Um, or just if I see something that reminds me of a person that I've spoken to recently, sending out, whether it's a just like an article or maybe even an email or an event, um, just finding things that are relevant to them. And again, this is where getting to know people, building relationships helps a lot um, to make sure you're actually sending out relevant information. But um, trying to add value where you can, um, especially because I'm on the younger side. I know that I'm usually the one gaining from my relationships because I'm younger, getting advice, feedback, guidance. Um, so typically where I can, I'll just say like, oh, this event might interest you. Or I saw this quote that I thought was interesting and thought um, you might find it inspiring, things like that, um, just to keep in constant communication where I can. And then of course, sharing updates about myself too. So we're not just wondering like, like where I've gone and what, what I've been up to as well. So just keeping up where I can, sharing tidbits of um, information. Yeah, I, I'd love to expound on some of the things of what happens on the side of the, the person um, that, that Danielle is likely emailing with who is older than her, who has more experience and is uh, maybe trying to help make things happen um, for her for whatever uh, she had been asking about. So there's, there's three things to keep in mind of the experience of the other person uh, that, that you're networking with. One is they, if you, if really you're just interacting with them for the first time or you just interact with them occasionally, you're not someone who in, in some ways like one of the meaningful people in their life, let's just say, is when they're talking with you, they're focusing on you. The moment they're not talking to you, they are not focusing on you anymore. And you have to realize this because it will change all your follow-up. And here's uh, what, what I mean by it. First of all, you will not expect that they will think about you later. So whatever it is that you wanted to ask them to think about with you, you better ask them while you're talking with them. They're not gonna do it later. So for example, when I'm talking to someone and they're asking me if I know of any consulting opportunities or a job in marketing or whatever the thing is that they're asking me about. Um, if there are some people that will just say to me, hey, if you hear about anything, okay, that might happen, but if instead they frame it, um, do you know of any people in the marketing world that I might talk to that might end up hearing about marketing opportunities? That forces me to focus in that moment. Who do I know that I can put this person in touch with? Okay, that leads to part two of what what you'll do differently in the follow up when you realize that person is not thinking about you after they hang up the phone or the Zoom or the whatever. So, and that is whatever they tell you that they'd like to do as a follow-up, it's actually on you to hold them accountable to do that thing. Because if I tell, like, let's say I'm talking to Danielle and I tell her, oh, so-and-so uh, in the finance industry and I'm happy to put you in touch. I'm not writing that down. <laughs> I'm intentionally not writing that down. Now, if I was working with a client, I would write down every word. But with Danielle, I'm, I'm in a relaxed mode. I'm not writing down, make sure to introduce Danielle to so-and-so in the finance world. So if Danielle doesn't follow up with me saying, hey, great talking to you. You mentioned you were going to put me in touch with so-and-so in the finance and, and let me know um, the, the, the timing of that so that I can look out for your email, something like that. Um, if she doesn't do that, 
I'm never going to make that introduction. It's just not going to happen. It has left my world. Um, so, so all the follow-ups, small or big, you'll send in a list, a numbered list is what I recommend. Like, here's what we talked about. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to all of this happening. Okay. And then the third thing is, um, uh, as, as someone recently from the South, I'll use uh, her expression, uh, it, it burns my biscuits when, <laughs> when someone actually has called me, I've put them in touch with someone. I hear three months later that they got the job offer and they've been working there and they're so happy or that they interviewed, but they didn't get it. Or they talked to the person and this happened, something happened and they never came back and told me about it. And to me, that's, um, yeah, that, that burns my biscuits because it's, I, I was being thoughtful and uh, what I saw is that they, they were not being considerate. Um, they, didn't, they didn't respond with that same consideration. It doesn't make a difference in my life what happened. Did they get the job? Did they not get the job? Like, it really does not make any difference in my life except that um, I have feelings too. <laughs> and so yeah. it feels inconsiderate that I went out of my way to do something and you never ever close the loop and let me know what happened with that thing good, bad, nothing, indifferent, still waiting. I want to hear about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and keeping all of those bridges. I agree. That's that's vital. I'm going to ask one more question here from Enrique in the chat, and then we're going to go into some breakout rooms and, and actually get a chance to connect with members of the, the community here. So um, from Enrique, what do you advise when small talk turns to current events, political opinions get shared, mm -hmm. which might not be popular? Um, what, what do you do? Do you avoid or do you engage? Uh, I, again, it's up to your your comfort level, you know, and you your own self awareness and your personal sort of ability to stand strong and whatever it is that you believe. See, again, thinking about what can happen, it's all just opinions, right? I never argue with anyone on their opinion. I, I listen. I, you know, might have some back and forth, but then you're entitled to that opinion. So, if you're going to enter into it, remember to enter into being respectful and. Um, standing strong in what it is that you believe it and not strong, not a, aggressively strong, <laughs> but just being assertive, like, no, that, that is my view. I respect your view. Your view, I, I expect the same, um, but it's really your choice. I've had people say things before like, oh, I, I really don't like discussing politics. And then I respect that. And then that doesn't happen. And then I've had um, conversations with people where I grossly disagreed with their politics and I let them talk and you know, we, we went our separate ways after that conversation and I and I try not to think ill of them afterwards. <laughs> but I think it's, it's really about your comfort level. And that's that's the point of all of this. You know, do what feels comfortable for you. Um, and, and when we say push yourself, push yourself to your comfort level, not like Alicia said, I have to go in with my stories and I have to, You maybe you have one story. Maybe you like to have your opening line be about someone's blouse or their shoes. I am big on complimenting people on shoes. So just whatever, whatever it is that works for you, that's what you have to figure out and then and kind of stay in your lane because that'll reduce your anxiety. When you feel comfortable with you, then, then it makes things easier. And I would say on that topic, um, if you are not comfortable ask yourself, what can I do to become comfortable as quickly as possible and get yourself there? Mm -hmm. So if it means stop talking to that person, mm -hmm. stop talking, change the subject, talk more quietly, step away, whatever you need to do, get comfortable. Um, I wanna add two other points to, to the original question also. Uh, one is um, it's really a good opportunity to practice diplomacy. So mm. I'm all about, if you want to share your politics, fine. But if you also great opportunity to practice, diplomacy is not easy, especially if you actually have a strong view. Um, but it is very important in uh, coalition building. And so it'd be great if more people uh, practiced it more. And um, I, I want to add one more point that just didn't come up that I, I think applies to, uh, or maybe I, I should have brought it up earlier because it applies to everything. And that is that remember that you never know who you're talking to and, and you will only begin to discover who they are by talking to them. Okay, how they appear does not tell you 
very much about them. Your first impression does not tell you, it, it, it's very limited data points. And um, I, I heard a wonderful story on public radio and I, I didn't catch who was saying it, but it was a, a, a black man who's a board member who was in one of those uh, board uh, meeting rooms that has glass windows and they were hiring for a very senior position. And while he was having a meeting, he was watching job applicants come in and he's in this fancy office. And for the first time, the people who came in for this job application were two black men, they were young men and they had their pants down like kind of near their thighs with their boxers showing and they had locks and he looked at them and his heart started beating faster and he said oh my god what are we going to do to make sure that they get a fair interview because those two might be geniuses they might be and and i loved the story and the way he told it and so remember that wherever you go the the all you're seeing is the 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 gift wrap around someone you're not seeing what's inside of them until you start talking with them I think that's a wonderful parting message for us all to remember. Thank you so much.